The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle is the seventh Sherlock Holmes short story, first published in 1892. Two days after Christmas, Watson finds Sherlock Holmes studying an old hat. Holmes explains it belongs to an unknown man who got into a scuffle with some ruffians. The man dropped his hat and a goose. As usual, Holmes makes a complex series of deductions about the hat's owner. And part of the reason I'm making this video is so I can discuss all of these deductions in turn. Because I think some of them are pretty iffy. Number one, the hat is large. Holmes deduces this man must be smart because he's got a big brain. Holmes is the smartest man ever. He should know that head size and brain power aren't directly correlated. If they were, Sherlock's head would be five times bigger than the rest of his body. Number two, the hat is expensive, but it's worn down. Holmes deduces the man has fallen on hard times recently because he's no longer rich enough to afford a replacement hat. That makes sense to me, but maybe the man's keeping an old hat because he likes it. I have worn out clothes that I keep for sentimental reasons. I also have my wedding suit. Because it was so expensive, I'm going to wear it until it falls apart into pieces. This man could be doing the same thing with his expensive hat. Number three. The hat has a broken hat securer. Take a guess as to what you think this means. Just for fun, see if you can match wits with Sherlock Holmes. I thought maybe it was broken in the scuffle. Or maybe the man is too lazy to get a new one. Holmes concludes, Well, the man's hat secure is broken? He has become immoral. Probably a drunkard. Wow, that conclusion does not fit the evidence at all. Holmes's proof is that not replacing a hat securer is a severe moral failing, while getting a hat securer in the first place is a moral positive. Let me quote the story. He had foresight, but has less now than formerly, pointing to a moral retrogression, which, when taken with the decline of his fortunes, seems to indicate some evil influence, probably drink, at work upon him. You heard it here, folks. Sherlock Holmes thinks a broken hat securer is enough evidence to accuse someone of being a drunkard. Number four, the hat is covered with dust. Holmes concludes the man stays inside a lot, because it's inside dust, not outside dust. Or maybe the hat was hanging inside a closet for a few months before he put it on that day. Number five, the man's wife doesn't love him anymore, because she let him go outside with a dusty hat. Okay, okay, that's another wild jumping to conclusions moment. Maybe his wife didn't see the hat. I don't require my wife to pre-approve every single outfit I wear. Number six, the man doesn't have gas lamps in his house because he has candle stains on his hat. He must use candles. That is a solid deduction. Number seven, the man put ink on his hat to cover up the worn out parts. Holmes concludes the man must still have some self-respect left. But if the man went through the trouble of fixing his hat, why didn't he get rid of the dust, or the candle stains, or fix the broken securer? Number eight, there's some hair left in the hat so we know the color and texture of the man's hair, as well as what he uses to clean his hair, and approximately when his last haircut was. Those are also solid deductions. So I'd say about a quarter of Holmes's deductions are solid and they make sense based on the hat's evidence. The others are not. But hey, maybe the fault lies with Watson, not with Holmes. Watson probably made up fanciful deductions to make this section seem more dramatic and to exaggerate Holmes's mental capacities. It turns out the hat is not the important thing in the mystery. The goose is the important thing. Hidden inside the goose is a valuable blue carbuncle. There was quite a stir when it was stolen from a countess five days ago. A plumber was arrested and is awaiting trial. The rest of the story is Sherlock Holmes tracking down where the goose came from. He advertises in the newspaper saying he's got the hat and the goose. The hat's owner comes to claim the hat. Holmes must be in a good mood because he doesn't lecture the man on the great moral evil of not immediately replacing his hat securer. 
The hat's owner clearly has no idea the goose is valuable. He says he got it from an inn. The innkeeper says he got it from a grocer. The grocer's an angry fellow who is sick of being asked about the geese. Holmes cleverly tricks the man by making a bet about where the geese came from. The grocer might be above taking bribes, but he's not against winning an easy bet. The geese came from a farm. Holmes and Watson are spared the hassle of going to the farm because the culprit appears at this point. He is once again asking the grocer what happened to the geese. So Holmes and Watson confront him. The culprit is Mr. Ryder. He is so scared and anxious, he can barely stand up. He explains that he and the Countess's waiting maid came up with the plan to steal the gem and frame the plumber. He panicked. He was terrified he would be arrested. His sister raises geese, so he shoved the gem into a goose's mouth and asked his sister to give him the goose for Christmas. She gave him the wrong goose, and he's been trying to track it down ever since. Mr. Ryder is ashamed of what he's done and begs for mercy. Holmes agrees to let Ryder flee the country, and Holmes doesn't tell the police anything. Holmes's justification is that Ryder's not a danger to society anymore. He's clearly too scared to ever commit crimes again. I wonder if Holmes keeps the mystery solution a secret so he can keep the valuable gem for himself. Because that's what he does. He keeps it for himself, he does not return it to its owner. I would say that's a greater moral evil than not replacing a broken hat part. As for Ryder's co-conspirator, the waiting maid, she's not mentioned. I guess she gets away with her crimes, and she'll probably try robbing the Countess again. No, Holmes only thinks about the plumber who was framed for the theft. Holmes expects the plumber will now be found innocent, because Mr. Ryder can't testify against him. Yeah, but what about the maid, and the countess, and the police? Will none of them testify against the plumber? The end. Post story follow-up. I thought this was an okay Sherlock Holmes story. It's got an extraordinary crime with an unusual element to it, as is typical of Holmes stories. The solution is unexpectedly simple. The culprit hid the gem in a goose, but he lost the gem when he mixed up the geese. It's interesting to see Holmes work his way backwards through the case, starting with the goose and ending with the theft. I expect the case would not have been as interesting if he started trying to solve the case for the Countess and then worked his way to the goose. It would have been a typical dramatic Sherlock Holmes move to burst into an unsuspecting family's house at Christmas and pull a valuable gem out of their food. I didn't like Holmes's deductions with the hat, which is why I spent several minutes talking about them. I know, Holmes loves to show off by making deductions about a person without ever talking to them, but in this case, there was more wild guessing than normal. I liked how he tricked the grocer with a bet. That was clever and fun to read. I'm not sure about the ending. It's nice of Holmes to forgive a repentant thief, but it's not nice of Holmes to become a thief himself because the gem would make a neat addition to his collection. I'd say the story has good elements and bad elements, so I give it a sideways thumbs up.